We're going to turn now to three poets from the Enlightenment as practitioners of what we might want to call the neoclassical style. The neoclassical style overlaps with the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment doesn't have a particular literary style that's built into it, but we think of the neoclassical movement as running approximately 1660 until about 1800 or so. Uh, in 17 uh, 98 in uh, England, William Wordsworth publishes uh, lyrical ballads with Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and that is generally considered to be the start of the Romantic movement in Britain. And we'll talk about Romanticism uh, in, in the coming days as we turn to the, the next major portion of our course. But the neoclassical style is really said to dominate English writing from about 1660 until 1798 in Britain, and then extends into about 1820 or so in the America uh, context in what we call the early national period. The neoclassical style is the style of Enlightenment literature. Whereas the Enlightenment is the embodiment of the philosophical ideas, the historical ideas, the scientific ideas, the cultural studies uh, components of the Enlightenment, the writing style tends to take on something that has been now called neoclassical. The word neo means new. And we have a sort of an ancient literary values are reappreciated for the first time. The writing done in ancient Greece and Rome is uh, translated into English by many British poets. Uh, the works of Homer, the works of Virgil, Ovid, Horace, uh, so on and so forth, are given the English translation. And there's a, an appreciation for the literary developments of the ancient world. What we think of is the pre-Christian ancient world as well. This is in a lot of respects then a repudiation of Puritan ideas and values about what literature is and how literature works, right? We have a, you know, a sort of a plainness uh, in the Puritan style, a focus on the Bible. If there's any sort of poetry being written, it's very private. You know, Anne Bradstreet's writing poetry, but she's not trying to publish it. It's only published against her. Um, knowledge in London and circulated uh, as you know the, the work of uh, a, a great writer in the Americas. Uh, we have an emphasis on the sermons and the narrative component with Bradford and Winthrop and so forth. So there's a, a the, the literary is taking a back seat to the sort of didactic side of things, the teaching or the instruction or the religious side of things. One of the ideas that kind of dominates during the neoclassical uh, style or the enlightenment as far as literature is concerned is an emphasis of literature as an art. That it is something that you get better at through attention and craft. You're supposed to work at literature. You're supposed to be developing literature. You're supposed to be reading and talking about literature. It requires study. Consistent with the values of the Enlightenment, neoclassical style writers would have thought the proper subject of art was humanity, the human condition, the human world, human concerns, right? And this becomes eventually an act of public art. We are entering into a world in the Americas where poems are being published as broadsides or pamphlets or in newspapers and starting to be read and appreciated by a larger public. So that we have an emergence of the public art. Francis Scott Key's The Battle of Fort McHenry, or I'm sorry, The Defense of Fort McHenry is uh, published in a, in a broadsheet form as a piece of uh, newsprint that would be circulated with context that people could buy it and read it and talk about it. So there's now a shift into the public realm of art. It's no longer private, 
or just meant to be you sort of contemplating the goodness of God in the form of your own poetry. The values of the neoclassical style, how might we describe it or characterize it? It privileges reason and harmony and balance, restraint, and order. Okay. We have a movement away from the sort of the, from the, the revelatory emotional experience of Puritan writing and instead thinking about what the mind is capable of doing. The emphasis on reason and the mind and intellect in the Enlightenment makes sense that those values are starting to over, translate over into literature. Intellect over emotion is part of the value set of the neoclassical style. That doesn't mean all the writing is a sense of emotion, or is, is, is in a sense emotionless. It just means that the intellectual side is starting to shine through in a clearer sense. And because this is writing that's overlapping with the Enlightenment, we might be particularly interested in the way that these poems play with images of light and dark. As we'll see in uh, one of the poems from Phyllis Wheatley, and certainly in the defense of Fort McHenry, images of light sort of predominate inside the poem, making them exemplars of the Enlightenment period. We're going to look at Wheatley and uh, Judith Sargent Murray as, and Francis Scott Key. I've got a couple lines from Phyllis Wheatley's On Being Brought from Africa to America up here on the board. We're going to turn to this in just a moment because I wanted to talk a little bit about the formal elements of poetry. We haven't talked about formal or in, uh, deeply literary functioning of texts aside from some basic ideas in our course. It's been mostly uh, putting texts in their historical moment and thinking about how the texts reflect the values or the um, characteristics of their historical moment. But I want to take a look at the first four lines from Wheatley's On Being Brought from Africa to America. Wheatley is a remarkable poet, a woman who was enslaved uh, and also uh, a woman at a time when we don't have many uh, female writers uh, in, on the literary scene. Um, she's a devout Christian. Christianity is a theme that runs through all of her poems. And you will see in this particular poem, it's, it's short, only eight lines long. It's nevertheless a complex um, poem that, that can make people a little uncomfortable when you sort of re realize what she's actually saying. But again, it's a view of people are complex and they can hold multiple views at once. It doesn't have to be a binary this or that. Wheatley writes, this is on page 715 of the Norton Anthology of American Literature, volume A, 10th edition, on being brought from Africa to America. Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a Savior too. Once redemption I neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with a scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. Remember, Christians, Negroes black as cane may be refined and join the angelic train. This poem reflects on the experience that Wheatley had of leaving Africa and coming to America, enslaved, and also becoming a Christian. And the poem says, by being brought from Africa to America, that is where she was exposed to Christianity. She didn't know it previously, she didn't know about it previously, but once she experiences it, she becomes Christian, Christianized. And she beseeches Christians to remember 
that everyone has the capacity to become a Christian. All humans can become Christians. The poem itself is framed, I think it's, it's a subversive poem in a couple of ways. I don't mean subversive in the sense that Wheatley is being ironic, but I mean subversive in the sense that she's making people really grapple with what she's saying and think about the logical extension of the premise that she is putting forward. She frames it in a way that on the surface might be uncomfortable, right? She is a Christian. She loves God. She loves Christ. She's proud to be a Christian. She's looking forward to going to heaven. And she recognizes that if she had not been brought or, and not um, experienced uh, this conversion brought from Africa to America, that she would not be a Christian and she would be poorer for it, spiritually poorer for it. So in a strange way, being brought from Africa to America as part of the slave trade allows her to become Christian, an act that she refers to as mercy and gives her the ability to be redeemed. This might seem contradictory to an expectation that uh, one might bring to the poem today, right? Um, it's a valuing of one religious system over another. She refers to Africa as a pagan land, right? A non-Christian land. It's saying as if Christianity is better than the religions of Africa. That's her experience in this moment. Um, and it's associating a positive of her experience with slavery that is becoming a Christian. But that's not all the poem is saying. And if one took it away in that sense, just took that away from the poem, they would be missing the larger picture that the poem is presenting. She says, some view our sable race with a scornful eye. Sable here, it means black. And citing a diabolic nature to their existence. But she beseeches the reader to remember that people who are black are just as capable of becoming Christians, just as capable of having their souls saved by God and being able to go to heaven for an afterlife with God, saved and redeemed through Jesus Christ. But the poem is operating on a number of really fascinating levels. Right? Take a look at the images of darkness in the poem. Right, uh, benighted soul. That means a, you know a soul of night. It benighted, and you know the dark uh, 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 image there. Right, sable image of black, um, dye or black as Cain. Right, a reference here to the the mark of Cain in the book of uh, Genesis, and uh, the idea of a, a race dark skinned people who are descendant from Cain. Um, was a popular notion of, uh, at this time with little pretext um, beyond what people wanted to see. So she's drawing attention to the dark imagery here, but she's also not using the word slave or slavery, right? It's the poem is not touching that particular word but images of slavery nevertheless abound in the poem, right? The title is being brought from Africa to America. Anybody brought from Africa to America at this time would have been understood to be enslaved. Also, the phrase may be refined. Refine is a word with multiple meanings, right? To refine something is to make it have you know, more grace and dignity and culture and class and made better, but a product can be refined as well. Oil can be refined, 
sugar can be refined, right? So there's a pun here on the word cane, C-A-I-N is the character from the Bible, as opposed to sugar cane, C-A-N-E. Black as cane may be refined, so the idea of sugar, a primary crop associated with those who were enslaved and forced to work in plantations. The image calls to mind the idea of enslaved individuals. But it's saying as well, too, perhaps its most subversive idea, which bears a striking similarity to the argument that Judith Sargent Murray puts forward in her essay on the equality of the sexes. The idea here is that if Africans have a soul that can be saved and is capable of immortality in heaven, then that calls into serious religious questioning, moral and spiritual questioning, the institution of slavery. So I think it's a poem that's an anti-slavery poem without explicitly saying those words and concepts. It relies on larger ideas of the Enlightenment to make those connections inside the the poem is written in a popular verse form of the neoclassical style called the heroic couplet. Heroic is used not because the form itself is particularly heroic, but because it was a style of writing that was frequently associated with epic poems at this time. Um, and epic poems tend to tell the stories of heroes and the classical world, and, you know, legends and mythic figures and so forth. So it's called the heroic couplet for that sense. The way the poem form functions, if you've never taken a class before that you know, directly talks about the functioning of poetic writing, is it's a form of what is called meter. Meter is a rhythm built into the nature of the language. It's a series of stressed and unstressed syllables. All human speech in English has this stressed and unstressed quality to it. Language has a natural rhythm, and if you slow down, you would see where words have a certain emphasis on a particular syllable or in a series of words. You know, if we say the dog, uh, you know, the is sort of the unstressed word, but dog is the stressed word as the noun in that pairing, right? Articles like a, an, and the, uh, or prepositions like by, or with, or to, or of, tend to be smaller or less emphasized than verbs and nouns and adjectives in English speech, right? If I say the dog, you know, it sounds a little different than the dog, which is what, what's going to sound a little more natural to your ear as a speaker of English. So we have a series of metrical emphases. And the heroic couplet relies on a style of writing called iambic pentameter. An I am, I A M B, an I am, which is how you, print, how you spell that, an I am is an, an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. Pentameter means, penta comes from Greek meaning five. So essentially, this is a meter with five I am. Let's read these four lines together and let's see if you can hear how it works. Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a Savior too, once I redemption neither sought nor knew. I think you can hear, as I read that line out loud, the way that the meter is sort of fluctuating up and down. Da 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 That's the meter of the line. And the iambic pentameter is the most common metrical form in English. 
There are variations. There are other types of metrical feet, as they're called. IMs, and then there's a trochee, which is a stress followed by a, an unstress, and then there's an anapest, which goes da da da, da da da, da da da, da da da. Okay, and we'll see an, an example of the anapest when we look at uh, Francis Scott Key's defense of Fort McHenry. But this is an iambic pentameter, right? Twas mer si brought me from my pagan land. One, two, three, four, five stresses in the line. And you can even draw it out further if you want. Drawing lines through the syllables to see where's the soft. Twas mer si brought me from my pagan land. Taught my benighted soul to understand. That there's a God, that there's a Savior too. Once I redemption, I their soft nor new. These are four lines of perfect iambic pentameter. And the couplet, and the term heroic couplet, you know, a couple is two, right? implies that what we've got going on here is a, is a rhyme scheme where lines one and two rhyme, three and four rhyme, and then the rest of the poem, five and six rhyme, seven and eight rhyme. So we have pairs of rhyming lines in the poem. Perfect example of the neoclassical style. When Thomas Jefferson says, Phyllis Wheatley is not a poet, right? He's looking at her through his racist lens. We have to say he must be wrong in so many ways, but definitely wrong in the sense that she's not a poet. I ask you to take a look at her poem to S.M., a young African painter on seeing his works. The poem is a, a beautiful meditation on uh, the power of art, uh, particularly on um, the work of black artists. Uh, it's not a very long poem. Let's uh, just take a moment and read it together. To S.M., a young African poet on seeing his works. I'm sorry, a young African painter on seeing his works. Apologies. To show the laboring bosom's deep intent and thought in living characters to paint, when first thy pencil did those beauties give, and breathing figures learnt from thee to live, how did those prospects give my soul delight, a new creation rushing on my sight? Still, wondrous youth, each noble path pursue, on deathless glories fix thine ardent view. Still may the painters and the poets fire to aid thy pencil and thy verse conspire, and may the charms of each seraphic theme conduct thy footsteps to immortal fame. High to the blissful wonders of the skies, elate thy soul and raise thy wishful eyes. Thrice happy when exalted to survey that splendid city crowned with endless day. Those twice six gates on radiant hinges ring, celestial Salem blooms in eternal spring. Calm and serene, thy moments glide along, and may the muse inspire each future song. Still with the sweets of contemplation blessed, may peace with balmy wings your soul invest. But when these shades of time are chased away and darkness ends in everlasting day, on what seraphic pinions shall we move and view the landscapes in the realms above? There shall thy tongue in heavenly murmurs flow, and there my muse with heavenly transport glow. No more to tell of Damon's tender sighs or rising radiance of Aurora's eyes, for nobler themes demand a nobler strain and purer language on the ethereal plain. Cease, gentle muse, 
The solemn gloom of night now seals the fair creation from my sight. This is a poem that reflects on the importance of art um, and the ability of somebody to use language or use the skills of painting to create awe-inspiring and beautiful images, right? She talks about how the painter uh, allows the beauties on the canvas to live uh, by breathing into them the, the life through art, right? They're breathing figures. Um, uh, that the that the um, that the painter creates on a canvas. There is an importance in art of longevity. That art can exist beyond someone's life. That's a kind of immortality associated with art. But Wheatley in the poem looks forward instead to heaven. And she talks about how an artist's role in heaven will be to use artistic ability now imbued with immortality and an angelic nature to be able to capture work that's so much better or so much more than able to capture here on earth. Images of light pervade the poem, right? Uh, we have images of um, uh, wonders of the skies, a city crowned with endless day, radiant gates, endless spring, darkness ends in everlasting day, heavenly murmurs glow, the muse will glow, and there will be um, uh, the, the, the opportunity to reflect and explore art in a way, uh, in a heavenly way, that is not uh, uh, able to be captured here on Earth. Now, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, neoclassical style is on display in Judith Sargent Murray's uh, On the Equality of the Sexes as well. The, uh, the work by Murray has a prose portion and a poetry portion. We talked about the prose portion when we considered uh, Murray as an Enlightenment thinker or an Enlightenment critic, uh, but I want to look at the poem as well because the poem, in the same way that Wheatley captures that pure, classic, heroic couplet, neoclassical form, so does Murray. Let's just look at the last stan the, the, la the second to last stanza of the poem. Yet cannot I their sentiments imbibe who this distinction to the sex ascribe, as if a woman's form must needs enroll a weak, a servile, an inferior soul, and that the guise of man must still proclaim greatness of mind and him to be the same. Yet as the hours revolve, fair proofs arise, which the bright wreath of glowing fame supplies. And in past times some men have sunk so low that female records nothing less can show, but imbecility is still confined and by the lordly sex to us consigned. They rob us of the power to improve and then declare we only trifles love. Yet haste the arrow when the world shall know that such distinctions only dwell below the soul unfettered to no sex confined was for the abodes of cloudless day designed. Meanwhile, we emulate their manly fires, though erudition all their thoughts inspires, yet nature with equality imparts and noble passions swell even female 
hearts. Much of the argument that Murray makes in the prose portion of the text is captured in the poetic portion of the text at the exact same time. She's writing poetry and prose, poetry and an argument at the same time, and they're making the same argument. When she writes, they rob us of the power to improve, then declare we only trifles love. Improve and love don't rhyme in our own sense, but there's a, there's a you know, in a, in a classical English sense, or at least on the page, they look like they might rhyme with each other. So they rob us of the power to improve and then declare we only trifles love, right? The point that she makes in the prose portion is that by denying women access to education, uh, then they, women grow up into adulthood and they don't have a proper education behind them, then men use that as evidence that women are not intellectually equal to men, even though it's through the power and the positioning of the society that they've been denied access to the very thing that would make them equal. Haste the era when the world shall know that such distinctions only dwell below. Now, this is, a, I think, a fascinating line, and I think it's doing a couple uh, things at once that is a, a great evidence of Murray's skill, or uh, Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Murray, as a skill uh, as a poet, right? Haste the era when the world shall know that such distinctions only dwell below. Now, in the next line, she indicates that what she's talking about here is the soul, right? That all souls are equal in the heavenly realm, right? All souls are equal in the heavenly realm. And that distinctions between the souls don't exist on earth, but there are distinctions between men and women on earth. Right? And so the point here is that the soul is not assigned to one sex or the other. All, both sexes have the soul, though they have different bodies. Yet I think the, the line also functions in an interesting way as a commentary on the human body. Right? If we think soul as a religious soul, right? that sort of ineffable part of you that brings life and character to this lump of flesh that we have, if we think soul in that way, then it has a good and logical religious connotation to it. But if we instead think soul as the heart or the mind even more, right? The mind, the soul, the sense of the self is the same across the sexes and the differences only lie below. With, an, with a, I think, a, 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 an emphasis in the poem on anatomical differences. So we have that sort of heavenly realm and earthly realm, high and below, but we also have that intellectual realm and reproductive realm, high and low, right? And it's interesting because at this moment in the text, we don't yet have a clear sense that that's what she's talking about. It's only in the next line that it becomes clear that she's talking about souls as opposed to pure body, right? Haste the era when the world shall know that such distinctions only dwell below. The soul unfettered to no sex confined was for the abodes of cloudless day design. Everyone's soul is designed to be able to live forever in heaven, she's saying. And that distinctions made here on earth are irrational or irrelevant. That denying educational access to women doesn't make any sense. And that, in fact, it's hurting women. And it's also perpetuating stereotypes and misogynistic viewpoints about women. But she's, in, she's practicing as well the heroic couplet process, right? Uh, yet haste the air, row when the world shall know that such distinctions only dwell below. Right? 
da 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 We've got the heroic couplet, the iambic pentameter style here. I would like to read a poem that is not included in your anthology. I think it's a terrible, terrible oversight. How could you have an anthology of American literature at this time and not include in the anthology Francis Scott Key's poem, uh, The Defense of Fort McHenry? Key's poem, or the first verse of Key's poem, is uh, well known to you as the Star Spangled Banner. It's written as a poem. It's not written as a song. Key's he is writing it as a poem. It's actually set to the tune of a British drinking song uh, called the, Anac uh, the, the Anacreonic Song. Um, and you're familiar with the tune of the Star Spangled uh, Banner, no doubt. Um, but the way in which I think the song gets set to the tune misses what Key is actually saying in the poem. Though I think the, the contrast between the poem and the song are well worth exploring. I'm going to read the poem as I think the poem is supposed to be read, based on the punctuation on the page. And I don't think it's gonna sound exactly like the national anthem as you might be familiar with it. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming? And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? Note, it ends in a question, not an exclamation, which is how it's sung as a national anthem question from the viewpoint of the person in the poem is wondering. Fort McHenry has taken on rockets and bombs, and the question is, has the fort fallen to the British? This is discussing a battle during the War of 1812. Has the fort fallen to the British, or do Americans still control the fort? That's the question. And at the end of the first stanza, we don't know the answer to that question. If you ever have an opportunity to be in an event where the, where the national anthem is sung, you know, slow down and think about what the text of the poem is actually saying. It's one of those things that you don't even hear anymore as you stand there listening to the national anthem because you're so used to the words and maybe you don't even know the words to the national anthem. Maybe it's just something that you sort of hum along with, as opposed to seeing the words spelled out on the page, which could be a very different experience. On the shore dimly seen through the mists of the deep, where the foe's haughty host in dread silence reposes, what is that which the breeze o'er the towering steep, as it fitfully blows, half conceals? half discloses. Now it catches the gleam of the morning's first beam in full glory reflected now shines on the stream. Tis the star-spangled banner, oh, long may it wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. So by the second verse we now know the flag is still flying, the Americans have held the fort. And where is that band who so vauntingly swore that the havoc of war and the battle's confusion, a home and a country, should leave us no more? Their blood has washed out their foul footsteps' pollution. No refuge could save the hiring and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. And the star-spangled banner in triumph doth wave o'er the land of the free and the home 
of the brave. Oh, thus be it ever when freemen shall stand between their loved home and the war's desolation, blessed with victory and peace. May the heaven-rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must, when our cause it is just, and this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner in triumph doth wave, or the land shall wave, sorry, the triumph shall wave, or the land of the free and the home of the brave. I wish I had mucked up that next to last line in the poem because I think it's important. The poem goes from does it wave, may it wave, it doth wave, it shall wave. So a question implying the past, then the present, and then the future. The flying of the flag represents a progress of time into the future. Uh, this is a poem written, I mentioned that there are other uh, uh, metrical feet. Uh, this is a poem written in the Anapest foot. A-N-A P-E-S-T, the anapest or anapestic foot, right? It has a, a one, two, three rhythm, right? There's almost a waltz-like quality to it, right? Soft, soft stress, soft, soft stress, soft, soft stress, right? Oh say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? We brought stripes and bright stars through the perilous flight where the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. Da 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 It's got like a that three three time to it. Um, that is characteristic of, of of something like a waltz, right? It's uh, it's four IMs, or I'm sorry, four anapests. So we would call it anapestic, and the word for four in Greece comes tetra. So, anapestic tetrameter, four ions, a meter of four, I'm sorry, anapest, a meter of four anapests is the rhythm here of the defense of Fort McHenry. I used the poem, The Defense of Fort McHenry, as the sample paper topic, or the sample subject for our paper, uh, our close reading paper. And I encourage you to go and read that sample paper, um, which will give you, I think, a greater sense of doing the analysis of this poem, things inside the poem that are worth noticing, right? Such as the verb tense evolving over the four stanzas, from a, a question of indecisiveness, to a question of revelation, to a question of continuing, to a question of the future. We go from does, to may, to doth, to shall. A movement of the American story. I also think this is an exemplary text. It doesn't have the heroic couplet neoclassical style, but it is an exemplary text of the Enlightenment in the sense that it really does focus on images of dark and light, right? The story here, right? Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, right? When the sun was going down, the flag was still up. Now that the sun is coming up, is the flag still flying? Is the question he is asking. Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming? So the flag stayed high during the, during the fighting. Rockets, red glare, and bombs bursting in air, right? That sets off light that allows them to continue to see the flag. But once the battle ends and night falls and the sun is coming up, does the star-spangled banner get waved or the land of the free and the home of the brave? Anxiety here. Does the, does the flag still fly? Is the country still standing? Has the fort fallen, in other words? In the second stanza, we now 
are seeing things a little more clearly, right? We've got half concealed and half disclosed. We're able to see a little bit, but not all the way. It's dimly seen, there's mist, it's silent, but then we get a gleam of the first beams of sunlight and we realize the flag is reflected on the water. Yes, the flag is still flying. And now the question is, where are the British? Where have they gone, right? Uh, where's the band who so vauntingly swore that the havoc of war and the battle's confusion, a home and a country should leave us no more, right? Where is that group of soldiers who thought they were going to win this battle and win this war and deny us of our home, right? Where are they now where their blood has washed out their foul footsteps pollution, right? No refuge could save them from running away or death. And the Star Spangled Banner continues to fly, right? Thus be it ever when free men shall stand between their loves, love, their loved home and the war's desolation, right? When the, the, the fight comes, right? It'll, it'll be like this. Thus be it ever, right? This is what we want going forward. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven-rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us in nation. Then conquer we must when our cause is just, and this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Spangled is an interesting word. It's, it's kind of like, all, it's sort of like a sparkle sort of idea, like the stars are, are spangling the band. They're, they're lighting up in the same way that stars do um, the, the, the flag itself. So we have images of lightness built into this song, and, and <laughs> this poem, sorry. I was thinking about the fact that there's a, there's a famous um, play, a famous line in a play, a, mo a modern contemporary play by the, by the writer Tony Kushner called Angels in America. And there's a line in that play uh, where a character, a very cynical character, who has seen the way that the AIDS epidemic is rab is just like absolutely wiping out and ravishing um, uh, the gay community um, and it is very kind of cynical about the fact that the government is not doing anything to intervene and really meaningfully help. He has a line in that play where he talks about how the writer of the Star Spangled Banner knew what he was doing because he put the note the musical note on the word free and put it so high that no one could reach it with their voice. And if you think about that in the, in like, it, the way that the Star Spangled Banner tends to get sung at like sporting events or any kind of uh, major event together, um, usually it says, or the land of the free, and then the singer really hits that high note on the word free, and then, and the home of the brave, right? You all can probably hear it in our heads right now as I say those words out loud. So in the play, the, the line is, you know, the word, the note on free is so high, no one can reach it, implying, I think, a much more cynical view of freedom in America but also probably one that is well worth considering and uh, reflecting on, especially if you're from a marginalized community. Um, is there ever a kind of free uh, freedom that is fully possible? Is anybody actually ever free in this nation, even those who have power and privilege? Are they constrained by that in a way? Is the whole idea of freedom an illusion, right? But I think it's important to remember, right, he wrote this not to the tune of a British drinking song, right? Those things were fused later together to form uh, the Star Spangled Banner as a song. But this is not the Star Spangled Banner. This is instead a poem, The Defense of Fort McHenry, written by Francis Scott Key. The poem raises interesting questions about what it means to fight for something, what it means to be free, uh, and the, the rhetoric of freedom and equality and liberty and the rhetoric of lightness and darkness are all wrapped up in the, in the poems from the Enlightenment, 
Wheatley and Judith Sargent Murray and, and also Francis Scott Key. The poems from the Enlightenment in particular are really great poems to do close readings on because they have that sort of attention to art and craft and study element to them. So you can see the way that the poets are doing really fascinating and interesting things with the language before them. This is going to bring our discussion of the neoclassical and enlightenment era to a close. We're going to transition next time into a discussion about the early national period. We're going to consider the, the writer Washington Irving. Irving is an interesting bridge figure in our course. We're always interested in those bridge figures who seem to connect movements together. And, and uh, Irving is one of the first uh, writers who's really able to make a living off of his writing here as a, as a writer in America. We're talking about changes to the literary marketplace. We're going to talk about the emergence of the age of Jackson uh, and how that changes the American culture moving out of the early national period into the Jacksonian period uh, and the emergence of romanticism. And romanticism is, are, is really going to concern us over the next few weeks. Uh, then we will turn to literature from uh, some more marginalized voices, a sort of enlightenment part two. Uh, if you want to think about it that way, and we will end with a, a deep dive and exploration into the literature of slavery, black antebellum literature, and also the literature uh, of abolition and uh, resistance to slavery, and the literature of the Civil War will close out our course. So we're moving through the course, we're covering lots of time in a very quick way, but I hope these lectures on the American Enlightenment have helped contextualize the readings that we've done and helped you see that uh, a literary and artistic and philosophical movement that's well known um, in a sort of uh, revered historical sense is actually a complicated, nuanced, and very artistic movement as well, like all historical movements are, full of uh, lights and shadows uh, and curiosities and uh, uh, thoughts that really ask us to think deeply on them and consider them. Uh, in order to get the most out of history.